The following program was funded through a grant from the Springfield Cable Endowment. Hello, I'm Richard Stevens. Where would modern transportation be without the ingenuity of two brothers, Frank and Charles Duryea, and perhaps this? We know Springfield as the city of firsts. Clarence Birdseye introduced America to the frozen food process here. Everett Barney brought us the all-metal ice skate. George Hendy's development of the bicycle gave us the Indian motorcycle. And right here on Taylor Street in Springfield stood the Russell Machine Shop, where Frank and Charles began work on their machine, America's first successful gasoline-powered automobile. More about how this comes into the picture later. But when the Duryeas arrived in Springfield, the picture at the time was bright. The rest of the nation suffered through a recession. Here in Springfield, local industries were enjoying unprecedented prosperity as a result of their contribution towards the war effort. We were somewhat insulated because of the wealth that had been generated here during the Civil War. The development of the Springfield Armory brought these hard metals workers here, and then at the end of each war, they dumped these people and they would go out into the labor market, these highly skilled hard metals craftsmen. Springfield in the 1890s was quite a town. The streets were bustling with commerce. Entrepreneurs were springing up everywhere. You realize the population of Springfield almost doubled from the census of 1880 to the census of 1900, from just over 30,000 to more than 60,000. A lot of the people working in Springfield at that time were, were craftsmen because of all the construction that was going on. Uh, so you not only had the hard metals, the people working in, in, the, in the metal industry, but you also had a lot, of, a lot of craftsmen here. Springfield streets were paved with cobblestones, street lights were lit with gas, there were no telephones, and electricity was just a novelty. In the 1890s, if you were on Main Street in Springfield, for instance, you'd be conscious of, of, of the trolley cars. The Springfield Street Railway was a, was a very, very successful uh, company. Of course, the Wasson Car Works was here, which made uh, not only regular railroad cars, but also very expensive uh, cars for special purposes. Supposedly, the most expensive railroad car ever built was built here in Springfield. So that was a major, that was a major industry. As you went down, uh, uh, you'd, you'd become conscious of the development of the department stores in the 1890s. Now, Steiger started during that period in Holyoke and then came down here, but Smith and Murray and Forbes and Wallace were already going here, so this would have been that kind of a mercantile center and a shopping center and everything. Also, the, uh, the, the theaters from an early time period, Springfield uh, was into music festivals, big festivals that would get national attention when they were held here. And Tilly Haynes was a great entrepreneur building facilities for theater and for music here. Springfield at this time happened to be the center of bicycle racing in the country. 
The National Bicycle Championship had been held for years in Hamden Park in Springfield. George Hendy, soon to be the inventor of the first American-built motorcycle, may also have been one of the first celebrities. There were Hendy hats, Hendy cigars, Hendy handkerchiefs. In 1883, our George attracted 38,000 people to the national championship at the park. You know, the Fisk Tire Company that, you know, time to retire by a Fisk, huge later manufacturer of, of automobile tires, actually started making solid tires for bicycles. <laughs> it, um, and a company in, in Chicopee made the uh, bicycles for the United States Army. By the way, it was the bicycle that brought Charles Duryea and later his brother Frank to the Springfield area. Well, not literally. You got to have this background about Charles to understand Charles a little bit. He was an inventor primarily in the early years of bicycle devices related to the bicycle. His first patent, if I recall correctly, was for a bicycle saddle. Uh, that, that uh, he patented while he was uh, working at a bicycle shop in St. Louis. Charles left home, first going to Washington, D.C., and in the meantime, he had invented a bicycle, which was called the Sylph. He went to uh, Owens Manufacturing Company in Washington, D.C., and hoped to have them manufacture the bicycles. Unfortunately, the blasted thing wouldn't sell. It was such an unusual device. It was awkward to handle. Uh, it, 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 it just wasn't, it wasn't selling. And Owens recognized this immediately. So he kind of defaulted on his contract. Charles always had an iron in the fire. He had lined up uh, a proposition in Rockaway, New Jersey with the Rockaway Manufacturing Company to build a bicycle. Well, the folks in Rockaway found out the same thing that the folks in Washington had found out. So this time, Charles is off to Chicopee, Massachusetts with the Ames Manufacturing Company, where he wants the same thing done. Charles Duryea was considered by many as the man with the ideas. When he graduated from the Giddings Seminary in Wyoming, Illinois, his uh, a senior thesis was on rapid transit. Now, you might say, aha, there's the con conception of the automobile. Sorry, no. What Charles was dreaming about in, uh, what was it, was 18, eight late, eight, mid, mid to late 1880s, was airplanes, flying machines, humming through the air, humming through the air, and uh, linking us with Europe. His brother, Frank, to the contrary, was a hands-on man, a born and bred engineer, mostly self-taught. He developed his mechanical skills by repairing his family's farm equipment. Frank was rather shy. He probably didn't circulate too much in, 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 in any kind of a social situation. And of course, he wasn't married until 1893, living in a rooming house. Charles, on the other hand, was an outgoing personality. A charmer from the word go, from what I've read. Extra, extra! Runaway streetcar kills two in Cincinnati. Erie beats Springfield in Eastern League Baseball. And I think it might be time now to go back and think about where did the idea for the car come from? Because as you get to 1890, 1891, you see this gestating, or at least being conceived. Honestly, the answer is not very clear. But it occurs to me, knowing what uh, uh, Charles and, and Frank were doing in Washington uh, before they went to Rockaway, it might appear that that was where the idea developed. They had been to the Centennial Exhibition like a lot of other people. And there was one internal combustion engine there, made by a man by the name of George Brayton. They had seen a Brayton engine operating. They spent an awful lot of time in the patent office in Washington. They read Scientific American. They journeyed to Baltimore to see a, a self-propelled streetcar. 
that they were amazed at seeing. And a lot of other things in that general character. It is highly probable, now I use the word probable, that it was there that the two of them schemed, schemed in, 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 the, in the positive sense of the word, to develop a self-propelled vehicle that would go on the common roads. While Charles Duryea dreamed of flying through the skies, the major form of transportation here on land was the horse and carriage. Springfield was renowned for its horse-drawn carriage industry. One of those carriage makers was David Smith of Park Street, just off Main Street in the South End. The quality associated with the David Smith carriage was the accepted standard of excellence in the carriage making industry. here they had well, about 30 people working here and at one time and they uh, there was a crew in the woods that just cut lumber and material for building the wheels and wood for running the steam you know it was all run on steam and it was a time when they did it all by hand but that was quite a while ago ever since the like the Civil War they had equipment to do most all of this type of thing The combination of these two technologies, the horse-drawn carriage of the old order, and one of the newest, the gasoline-powered internal combustion engine, were drawn together by the development of another technology, the bicycle. You might think that the bicycle is a pretty simple item, but 100 years ago, the bicycle industry was one of the most advanced. It was on the leading edge of technology, it used gears and sprockets for the transmission of power and principles of levers and ratios to control that power. It was advancing technologically comparable to today's computer industry. The bicycle. And then as you transform into the auto age, it's applying motorized motors, engines, to bicycles in order to provide more convenient and faster land transportation. During the 19th century, America was experiencing a westward growth that was opening new opportunities for individuals, businesses, and industries. To meet this expansion, the railroad was pushed farther westward. Soon, railheads were situated at strategic points, and with them came population centers. After the Western Railroad went through here, and we're talking now 1838, um, then the, what became the New York, New Haven, and Hartford came in and then the what became the B&M, the Connecticut River Line, uh, went up to Northampton by 1845. And then those companies started to compete because what became the New York, New Haven, and Hartford wanted to get to the Canadian markets. And, and the B&M wanted to get down to New York. And so there ended up as sort of a gentleman's agreement among the railroads. So it made Springfield the meeting place of those three major airlines and, I mean, uh, railroad lines. However, that part of the population that lived in communities that were not on the rail lines were left to use the horse as the primary mode of long distance travel. It follows that those people needed something that would give both dependable and economical transportation. That need was the spark that lit the flame of invention. Yeah. 
We had the need, we had the technology, we had the people. What we needed was a good cigar. One day in the spring of 1892, Erwin Markham stopped by the cigar shop at the Massasoit house to pick up a couple of his favorite cigars. You see, his wife wouldn't allow smoking in the house, so he'd have to savor them on his walk home to Spruce Street. While standing in line to buy his cigars, he overheard a man in front of him talking to the clerk about a dream to build a carriage powered similarly to the way the German inventor Carl Benz had done a few years earlier. As an entrepreneur and visionary himself, Mr. Markham joined in the conversation. He was soon persuaded to risk the sum of $1,000, thus becoming the first investor towards the first Duryea automobile. Benz in Germany, Daimler in France, and Duryea in Springfield. The development of the internal combustion engine was unique to each inventor. The Duryeas used the auto principle a series of motions within the engine consisting of a means of drawing in a charge of fuel and air called the intake stroke. Squeezing the charge into a smaller area, the compression stroke, igniting or exploding the fuel air charge, this part of the work cycle is called ignition, allowing the explosion in the cylinder to push in the top surface of the piston, this is the power stroke and transfers the energy to the crankshaft, and finally evacuating the spent gases through the exhaust system, the exhaust stroke. By mid-September, Frank knew he was very close to being able to try his new machine in the street. Earlier that summer, he had driven the carriage chassis across the floor of the workshop. On a later try, Frank succeeded in getting the engine started, but failed to stop the automobile once it started moving. As you might imagine, a vehicle in motion, no driver, another Springfield first, the first automobile accident. Charles was anxious to head for Peoria, Illinois, where he was to start a new bicycle manufacturing business. But he very much wanted to see the engine of his new machine in action before he left. Charles was desperate for money. Charles returned to Peoria for the same reason he came to Chicopee, for the same reason he went to Rockaway, to get another opportunity to get his bicycle into production. He had someone interested, uh, Sieberling was his name, the man who made, a, made tires, uh, in producing the Sylph bicycle again. Today, starting and operating a car is so simple, you and I don't even think about it. But in 1893, the Duryeas had only a few clues as to how to get their engine running and keep it running. In one test, they tried an alcohol burner and a perfume atomizer. And even when the engine was started, in the workshop, on a sawhorse, they were not always sure that it would keep running under road conditions. Despite these concerns, there was real hope that this car would be the money maker they believed it could be. In September 1892, Charles went to Illinois, and it was left to Frank to complete the car. Despite the low pay he must have been getting, living on scant checks from Mr. Markham, Frank was like a man possessed about the car. D.H. Nesbitt writes, While this car was struggling through the birth pangs of invention, guided by the brain and hand of Frank Duryea, he lived with me in Chicopee. I remember all those discouraging factors. I remember when this small capital was exhausted. I remember also Frank's beard. We had a lot of fun over that. I remember Frank being chased to bed at two in the morning, not once, but dozens of times, as he schemed and planned. I also remember the crude method he had of exploding the gas charge by a small tube heated with a kerosene burner so that it was red hot. I happened to work then in the electron company and suggested that he needed a make and break spark electrically produced. Yes, I knew all about what that boy went through. Read all about it. No use for horse. Springfield. Mechanics devise new mode of travel. Mechanics claim great things. 
Extra, extra. Despite the success others were having, the Duryea project was slow going. Mr. Markham was impatient to see the results of his investment, and the carburetor and ignition were still giving Frank trouble. Added to that was a long bout the past fall with typhoid that had no doubt left him weak. Frank was left when Charles departed with an unworkable engine in, at that, at that point, un, not installed even in a workable car. He was left with the, every bit of the challenge of, in fact, constructing a viable automobile that would run on the common roads. The impact on Frank, I think, was to raise his sense of, of uh, well, compulsion to the point that he had to actually thought he had to fulfill this, this, this uh, dream. And he, I think he sensed that it was in his hands. In August, Frank wrote to Charles on the progress of the car. Number 18, Kibbe Avenue, Springfield, Massachusetts, August 28, 1893. Thought it well to write you at present and tell you that I have got the carriage almost ready for the road. Want to get it out Saturday if possible. We'll take it off somewhere so that no one else can see us have the fun. I have a man at work now on the scheme. It pays better, I believe, to keep a man at work than to do all myself. A man cannot work and scheme. Pays better to scheme let someone else work. Get your paper here. West Springfield gets electric street lights. Extra, extra. Trial delayed because jury poisoned by peas. New horseless carriage runs Springfield streets. Finally, on September 21, 1893, under the cloak of darkness, after almost two years of trial and error on their motor car, nearly a year and a half after the ladies' phaeton had been purchased from David Smith, and a year after Charles had returned to Peoria, Frank had his first public ride. There were still problems with the transmission system. The rubber belt was stretching too much and wasn't transmitting enough of the engine's power to the wheels. A leather belt was an improvement, but when hot, it slipped. Then Frank remembered a gear-type transmission he'd seen at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in October. But not all the problems were mechanical. He had some problems, sure. He had some problems with finances. Uh, Markham was a reluctant financier. Now, he was, I say reluctant, he, he put in the beneficent sum of $2,800 eventually, though he had only agreed initially to put in $1,000. But uh, the entire responsibility for the redesign and the construction of the 1893 Duryea fell to Frank. And Frank's response was, I'm going to get it done somehow. Frank offered to work without pay to put in the gear and clutch system if Markham would only supply money for needed materials. In a letter to Charles, he writes, have all bills stand off till the 1st of December. Then $30 rent will be due and a stove bill of $10. Have sufficient cash on hand to pay other bills, groceries and fuel to that date, and can then run groceries for a time if necessary. Have had but little experience in financial policies. Perhaps you have some suggestions for better management. If I knew positively that we would have Boodle in a week or two, or even at the end of the month, could feel a little easier. But it is not a sure thing, however. Hope the roads will remain good. Bad time of the year to hunt Boodle. Your brother, JFD. There are. I don't know how many letters, I've never counted them, of correspondence between Frank and Charles, where Frank consistently keeps Charles up to date as, what to, as to what is happening and the changes that he's making. No indication, direct indication, that Charles, on the other hand, wrote back to Frank. Now, if they did, those letters are lost. 
their absence or unavailability to current scholarship, I think is a significant issue. Their absence would suggest that Charles had nothing to do whatsoever. Extra, extra! Sextuple murder in North Carolina! A trip without horses! Duryea automatic carriage travels about the streets of the city. Yes, in January 1894, the car was tested with the new transmission. It ran beautifully, traveling a four-mile section of Springfield for its first run. Scant attention paid to the, uh, the appearance of the, uh, of the Duryea, of course, in 1893. I think primarily that was due to a general lack of interest in automobiles. I think it was due to the fact that the car wasn't all that hot. It just wasn't a really a viable, saleable car. So I don't think there was the, the shock we had seen the inventions of Blanchard. There were many people living in Springfield who had known him, you know, and known these. He was a genius. So they had seen him. They had seen the Ames, now the original Ames, David Ames people. Imagine a, a company in, centered in Springfield, owned by a Springfield family. They made more writing paper than all other writing papers in America combined. They had already seen those revolutions of Blanchard and of Ames, and then the development of the, some of the finest locomotives ever made, the most beautiful and expensive railroad cars. They saw this, so they're better prepared than most people. You know, if you went to somebody in Springfield and said, hey, you know, welcome to the industrial age, they say, where have you been? Although the successful run of the Springfield Duryea noted only modest mention in the Springfield newspapers, no one could have foreseen the impact this would have on American automotive technology. Indeed, this was the spark that ignited an explosion. The next model, however, that Frank went to work on, the, the Chicago car. Now you begin to get a car that contained practically all of the elements of the modern automobile. They even had brakes. It had a crank. It had electric ignition. It had a carburetor. It had gear drive and an axle like a modern car. Virtually, it had rubber tires. In fact, there's very little on cars today that wasn't on that uh, 1894 Duryea. And of course, the, the, the Duryea's that went on to be manufactured by the Duryea Motor Wagon Company, uh, 13 of them the first year, uh, were extraordinarily high-performance cars of their day. Uh, a Duryea won the Chicago race in 1895. A Duryea won the next race in 1896 uh, from uh, New York City to Irving, uh, Irvington on the Hudson. Uh, in fact, there were four Duryea's entered in that, in that race. What impact? They were leaders. And of course, the Duryea Motor Wagon Company, organized in September of 1895 here in Springfield, was the premier automobile industry, the beginnings, the father of the automobile industry here in the United States. National Museum of American History of the Smithsonian Institution, the Springfield Duryea takes its rightful place among American automotive pioneers and those who are to follow. I'm Richard Stevens. Thank you for watching.
The preceding program was funded by a grant from the Springfield Cable Endowment. Watching Quadrangle Television. involved through automobiles and things that we've done in the past and a couple of years ago almost a couple of years ago he uh, had mentioned that he would get interested in this durier which i really didn't know much about probably had heard it in passing and he uh came to my shop and he brought a wooden mock-up of a motor single cylinder hit or miss motor i'm familiar with him i'm into the as a hobby thing that i do now and I thought this was pretty interesting. He said he wants to build one. I went, phew. Castings, trying to figure it out. Spark, gasoline, carburetor. And we made it happen. We were sitting there, and Jimmy and Dick was carrying on the conversation about building this particular unit and he was looking for a machinist. And Jimmy looked at me, smiled at me. I knew it was coming. He says, I want you to int introduce you to the machinist that you're looking for. And Dick goes, who might that be? He says, he's sitting on the left-hand side of you. I looked over at Jimmy. Dick looked at me. And I think at that moment, the mutual bond between us became right then. Hello, I'm Richard Stevens. You're going to see one person's dream to live a piece of American history from idea to plan to reality. I hope you enjoy it. It started out in 1985 as a research paper for a course at Springfield Technical Community College on the history of the Pioneer Valley. 
As an automotive person, I had no idea what I was going to write about. However, when I began doing research, I made this wonderful discovery that the first American automobile, as we know it, originated in Springfield. After three years, I finally was able to actually see the car, and I thought that's a little too much, that it should take so much effort to find this part of a national treasure, so I decided to make it. I might add, however, that the original car still exists, and it is in the Smithsonian. I was allowed access to that car to simply take a piece of paper, pencil, and a ruler and dimension every part on it. And this is what you see. This is a one-to-one -one scale of that car. My first um, component was to make the engine because I knew that the carriage was a fairly common design, but the engine was very unique. So this is a basically a wooden prototype. And it allowed me, in, in making it, as Frank had to do also, it allowed me to determine the relationship of all the parts as they interrelate as a single component. On the four-stroke engine, one of the strokes necessary is called the exhaust stroke. And right here, this plunger opens the exhaust valve and allows the exhaust gases to leave and go into the exhaust system. It's operated by a set of gears that have one gear twice the diameter of the driving gear so that for every rotation of the crankshaft, this one operates only one half a turn. So in two complete crankshaft revolutions, we get one complete exhaust stroke because this is only rotating half as much. In 1892, one of the first purchases made by Charles Duryea was the carriage that ultimately this new concept of an engine was to be installed. The carriage is known as a ladies phaeton. It's basically a very lightweight carriage and it was purchased from the Smith Carriage Works right here in Springfield. And the price that was paid in 1892 was $70 for a used carriage. I really had very little knowledge of how the carriage was constructed. I was fortunate enough to locate a book entitled Practical Carriage Building, which interesting enough, was published in 1892. And that provided me with uh, all the nomenclature, the terms and part identification as well as a product that went into the manufacture of a carriage body itself. Two years ago, I was able to purchase a ladies' phaeton, a used ladies' phaeton. And of course, the first thing I did was to take it apart to see how it was put together. One of the interesting pieces of information that I discovered in the course of my research on carriage building was that carriage makers, at least um, into the last part of the last century, as well as the early part of this century, turned out to be basically, in some aspects, assemblers, just like uh, current automotive manufacturing. There were companies that made axles, there were companies that made springs. There were companies that made roof bows. There were companies that made um, the very, all the various parts, the, the uh, steps that got people into the carriages. So that there were a lot of parts that were purchased by the manufacturers. But the actual carriage, this part of carriage assembly, was done on site. In 1988, I built my first prototype of the Duryea carriage. And having no knowledge of what kind of material was used, I thought to myself, well, if this carriage is to support two people, then obviously it has to be made from, from strong, heavy wood. So I purchased ash. Now, 
Ash, by all accounts, is an extremely strong, workable, but heavy wood. So when I had completed the first carriage, the first prototype of the carriage, with all the iron attached to it, the, the carriage body itself weighed over 100 pounds. Now, when you compare that 100 pounds to the carriage body that I finally produced, which is made primarily from poplar, it goes from 100 pounds in ash to approximately 30 pounds in poplar. So you can see the, the difference between the two woods. And the idea is to make it light. But also, the poplar is a very strong wood. So I had both a light and a strong carriage body to use on the, on the uh, durya. I might add that every location where there is a screw in the construction of the carriage is exactly where the, the carriage makers of the last century would have placed them. Most of the carriage body itself was pieced together, for, apparently for reasons of repair, if there was a need to replace a certain part and if they could do that. So very few pieces were actually hard glued, never to come apart again. After the carriage body gets assembled and it's time for the upholstery, the, um, the side panels and the rear seat, the rear seat panel will be part of the carriage itself. The seat portion itself of the carriage will be like a pad because there's a, there's a cargo cover that's actually under the seat, so there has to be accessibility to that. Between the information that I was able to obtain from the manual, as well as a visual inspection of how the, the ladies' phaeton was constructed, I then had the knowledge of how to build the carriage that we used for this, this uh, 1993 Springfield Derry. One of the things that I had to deal with in the production of this car was that there really were no parts for, for the engine that I could purchase off the shelf. So naturally, parts had to be cast. So we chose Ware Foundry. It's uh, been in existence since the early 20s. It originally was a power plant, but we now serves the purpose of casting metal parts. been working closely with us is Bill Jordan, the man that owns the foundry. And Bill has a lot of experience in the foundry work and was able to follow my instructions and produce patterns and castings that we ultimately were able to machine into a successful product. The block alone consisted of 14 separate indiv individual patterns. And collectively, when it was done, there was simply one piece that had been cast.
there are several parts in the carriage that uh, in no way was I capable of producing. And one of those, of course, are the wheels. I found the name of a gentleman on the north shore of Boston by the name of Bruce Tompkins. Bruce owns a wagon wheel factory that has been in existence for approximately 150 years. And Bruce uses the same equipment that was used 150 years ago and is capable of producing wheels of the same quality, same strength, the same design that were on the original ladies' fiat and carriage that was used by Frank and Charles Duryea 100 years ago. here they had well, about 30 people working here. One person made hobs and one person made spokes and then somebody assembled the whole thing but the blacksmith made the tire and there was a crew in the woods that just cut lumber and material for building the wheels and wood for running the steam current and it was all run on steam. And there was a time when they did it all by hand but that was quite a while ago. Ever since the, like the Civil War they had equipment to do most all of this type of thing. You'll have fun at the Springfield Science Museum. Sleep overnight with your family or group. Learn about science firsthand in Saturday classes for all ages. Make friends with a snake or gaze at the heavens in the planetarium. Discover the people and wildlife of Africa. Visit the Exploration Center and build a bridge of magnetic sand. Learn how Native Americans lived and investigate the natural world. There's all this and more at the Science Museum, located at the Quadrangle in downtown Springfield. Plan to visit soon. I think what I'd like to do, at least uh, in terms of our beginning of this project, would be to take and assemble the carriage using the wheels, the front and rear axles, and the springs, and at least build the carriage itself. After we get the carriage built, we can take the carriage body off the assembled axles, and from that point, we can then begin putting the engine onto the rear axle. But at least at that point, I want to get the carriage freestanding, and we'll take it from there. Okay? Let's go. Okay, what I need to do is determine which of these two springs is right and which is left. So why don't we stand this carriage body right up on its nose? Take this one. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, pick it up just like that. Okay, got it. All right, I'll get the Okay. Make sure I got the correct side. All right, mark that as uh, R. Let me just double check on the other side. Make sure we got alignment here. Okay. Now, before you put it down, let me just double check one more time. 
on the other spring. The holes line up on that correctly? I'm hoping they do. Um, that's what I'm trying to do is to make sure I've, I've got the right spring on the right side and the left spring on the left side. Okay, that's good. This is the left spring. I should begin by putting the bearing on the shaft. Sliding this through. Excellent. Okay. Put the um, outer bearing in. Okay, it's coming in, it's coming in. All right. It's snug, it's snug. Okay. No, make it snug. Straps for, right. for the, the base of the block. Okay. Also, the straps to hold the springs in place. Right. Let me just turn this around this way just for a moment. I want to uh, just uh, check and make sure that they're on your straight. Any more on that? No, that's fine. Okay. Let me just check the other side. All right, now we can do the front axle. Now, before we put this in place, we need to take the spring block. We have to drill two holes in the spring block. Oops, no, it's, sorry, that's the right spring, it's that one. All right. And we have to drill two holes through the uh, bottom that line up mm -hmm. with that. And let's take and we'll disassemble the spring yeah. here. We'll we can do that. And yeah, we right. can just uh, you know, take, you get a what, 5 8 wrench. Yeah. And when, when we take it apart, he can drill the holes. Yeah, yeah. So we, can, we can assemble this now. The, uh, put the tiller support piece right here. Sure we get the front correct to the back. Okay. Okay. Now we start off by putting the main leaf in. Okay, we'll put the smaller leaf this way and maybe we can fit should we uh, put it right okay i'll put that one right down the throw nope. you're proud of that it's not what it was intended to do but i think it'll do it Just a matter of tapping into place. Now, hang on. You just pin to run that. that to keep them from turning. Sure, that's, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, that's good. 
we need to do is to take some bolts and attach this spring bar to the top half how, of the spring. How do you want to run this down? We'll put the bolts down through. Okay. The thread, threaded part is always concealed as much okay. as possible. It's the nature of the way that carriages were built. Now this is this this particular piece, this spring bar may not be perfectly straight with the spring, so um, is that going to cause us? Just understand that it may not set perfect, later? perfectly straight. Is that going to cause us grief later? No, but I will correct it before the final assembly. Is this, this decorative up here? Or yes, actually, in the original, that was like an eagle's head. That's what they used on all these spring bars. It was part of the craftsmanship of the day. Mm. Yep. Mm. All right, we can put this on here. And uh, which it doesn't make any difference. There's no front to, front to back. There is, however, on the bolts. The bolts have to come from, okay, just this watch out. From the front to the back. Here, David. The hammer behind you. Okay. Henry Ford. No. This is the front. So. Right. Okay. Okay. When we get the wheels, we can put the wheels on the axle. Where's the cast bearings already? Oh, there's a cast lead in that. All right. Once you get to the other wheel also, Jim. Okay, I'll get one. All right. Right on, give his arms a break. Yep. I think my official job today is uh, something we this one we may need to take on a little bit. Okay. The help you get nowadays. <laughs> Sorry. I want to kid him, Jim. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. That should be. Uh, let me. All right, Dick. Now. Double check these. You still. Grab the reach. Okay. And the two half inch nuts. And the flat washer. I got the axle. Okay. Was this uh always double nutted? Yes. Okay. One of the one of the interesting things about this carriage that differentiates from other carriages is that this actually causes the reach to pivot in this way to the carriage body. Mm -hmm. In the original carriages, this was called the fifth wheel, and it was actually mounted this way so that the front axle turned on, on the, underneath the, uh, the carriage this way. So basically, this is one of the first independent front end. wheels. Front wheel steering, right. Mm -hmm. not, not too tight. Okay. In fact, um, there were about 15 different firsts that were on that car that are still in use today. Mm. And the independent front wheel steering is certainly one of them. All right. Okay. Looks like we're ready to put these on? Uh, I hope so. Okay. All right, let's put the rear, sp the right spring on first. Now, the way this is set up marked it right here. is the head of the bolt goes to the outside with a nut on the inside. All right. Jim, I should take that. I'll hold, I'll hold the spring. Okay. Just something temporary right now. Is that going to be in the way if we put it on the inside or put it on the outside? We have things in here. No, because this will take off once we get ready to deal with the engine. We can take okay. the whole spring right off because it. Okay. You know, another, I think I think it may be a valid point though. Okay. Go ahead, tighten it up. This is another tool that uh, we're, that they didn't have back then. I'm sure they had levers and. Well, they did have clamps, but I'm not sure they had all the sophisticated oh, yeah. tools we have today. Right. Okay. The outside out, right? Uh, yeah. All right. That's correct. Dick, you want to tighten that up for me? Mm -hmm. 
I could do that. Walk me up. All right. Get the body. Yep. Yeah, you're going to leave it? Yep. No. Okay. I can crawl over. Put the block of wood in, too. Feel heavy, huh? Yes. You can only pick up a car body that way. Some you can. Yeah. Very, very light. Some of those new uh, plastic things. If you have the bullets behind you. Yep. I got them right in my hand. Oh, okay. Okay. Hang on a second. Okay. I'm to scratch my nose. All right, now we need to put uh, at least some nuts in the bottom of one nut in okay. each of them. Tim, can you pick up a little bit in the front? Sure. Not too much. Is that? All right, why don't you bring the body up, the uh, rocket irons, and so we can set them on the spring bar okay. and secure them. Well, I got fine. Just wash it or not. Thank you. Well, bear in mind that the whole carriage weighed in about 150 pounds. Actually, the body itself weighs about 35 or 40, mm -hmm. and the iron weighs another 20 or 30, and then you get passengers in it, so it's really not a lot, a lot of weight that it has to support. Plus, it's structural. It's using the grain of the wood, mm -hmm. so it becomes fairly strong. Okay, we have, for all intent and purpose, assembled the carriage. Okay, I think we're at an interesting point because now we want to put all these pieces, the block, the frame, the legs, onto the, onto the axle. So we get the block over here, the legs, um, nice. we need the crankshaft, the crank. and the bear why don't you hand me the crankshaft and the bearing mounts? All right. Okay. Get this here. And the frame itself. Rick, you got the bolts up there? Yeah, there you go. Okay. I know. What do you suggest? We set it on the axle, and we'll use one of those stands to support this end of the, of right. the block. Okay. Now, again, the half inch wrench is. Over here. Over there, okay. You know, I, I hear the engine in my sleep almost, but I've never, I've never had it in my dreams that I've actually ridden in this car. Leave it a little loose. All right, why don't? Okay, you want to put that underneath the center of this? 
so it's in the center of the rock off. All right, I think um, we can put the, the frame on. I don't know how you they assemble that. Whether you they put both, they both have to go together. Okay. Okay. Two long ones in the spacers got to go between the bottom. The now, what is this? What's dowel? Uh, These are dowel. The caps, the caps to the cylinder is dowel. So then once we once we get to a, a, a arrangement here and levelness, what I can do is I'll transfer from here into the into the main bearing caps. No. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should we hang All it? All right. Yep. Let's hang it. It hangs yeah, down. This comes. Uh, the spacer comes up okay. just like that. Yep. Yeah. Let me get up here. Hang the, on. The longer bolts go. Longer bolts go on the bottom. Okay. the legs on and they go facing the back because okay. this is what supports the uh, final right. drive shaft. Uh, right. We can adjust the height. Uh, just drop them all the way down? Yeah, I'm just going to snug them. Of the uh, bolts. What did you tell me about the relationship of the slots, the center line of the clutch shaft? Was it the lowest or the highest? If you wanted to maintain the flywheel being in the utmost position toward here and have your cl uh, clutch and brake drums up, they want to be up as high as they want to be. They should go all the way up. Okay. And from there we can space we it can down. drop it down. Right? Okay. That that should give you a quarter inch between the clutch drum and the flywheel and the quarter inch between the the main bearing and the and the, uh, the flywheel. Now are each side the same deck running from the same from the left to the right the right of the carriage, they both go to the same relationship out? That's correct. Um, <clears throat> I believe the top one either one of these goes to the top side of the axle on both sides the right and the left mm -hmm. then the bottom of the spring goes to this leg and on the outside of the axle there's a second one that goes down to this leg oh, and yeah. that's that's what supports the whole back end of the carriage onto the rear axle mm -hmm. then the reach and the head block on the front of the carriage comes back and one goes in here mm -hmm. on each side one goes in here on each side, and there's a third hole right here that comes in and catches the reach way in the back side, so it sort of gives it added stability on this end of the of the reach. So those make up the 12 rods that hold the um, hold the, the engine to the rear axle and the engine to the front head block. Okay. That's it. Before you before yep. you make any modification, any adjustments on that, we have to square up the block. Okay. I just realized that it's not it's not uh, as square as it can be. For. So, um, we need to um, establish some kind of a datum. How about if we go to the outside of the straight edge across the tire, measure inward? No, it's got to be the axle. And then the axle from here to here? And just measure right off the top, right in the center line. Okay. 30 and 3 quarters. In that corner. 30 and one quarter. So this is a half inch. This has got to go this way, a half inch. Okay, that, that's good. Okay. That's good right there. Yeah. I'm going to pick that up and relieve it, you know, the pressure because this one wiggles. And then we'll recheck that. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's double check here. Okay, we have four and a quarter. We have four and four and seven thirty seconds. 
That is fairly close. Yes. You want to try the crank again? Or you should leave it down. Yeah. Let's check. Uh, try the back side of the axle, just for the hot house. Here? No, oh. the back side. There you go, the back, that corner right there. Oh, here. Thirty-one and one-eighth. Thirty-one and one-eighth. Okay. So that to the, 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 from that corner to here to that corner is on target. Let's try the square again. I'm going to say the twist may be in that System there. In the uh, in the casting bit of this. Arc. Okay. Let's record. Come in just a little bit, Jeff. Bingo. I need to bring back this. Wedges. I'm going to put the front wheel. Okay. Side of it. You may need to uh, jockey the front a little bit. Okay, now hang on a second. Here's where we're going to have a little problem is getting that reach in through there. That's why I want to okay. move the crankshaft. Whoops. Oh, no, we're hitting the clamp. Hang on. Okay. Get it. Okay, that's good right about there. Um, how maybe we can clamp. Where'd that clamp go? I put it inside. It's on the, it's on the welder. Or below the No, on the floor. On the floor. We're going to have to raise the front of the block up because the springs are really beveled. Okay. So. Just a second. Anyway, okay. No, the wood won't go in. Cross. From where Pick up the center of the uh, uh, center bolt on the spring. Okay. Okay, we're one inch off. Um, this side, it's like, the, it, it's the front axle. I mean, the front axle is just this way a little bit. 
because we haven't got the, the reach is being stressed. Right. Probably a way to do that is with the tiller. And that gives us a pretty straight line for the front. The front. We're off by a 64th of an inch. Oh, wow. What are we going to do? Call Charles. <laughs> Redesign. How do we tell the top from the bottom? Top goes away from the intake. Okay. Top goes away from the intake. All right. I don't, Danny, no, I don't need your, the electrics on. Dan? Okay, we now have the cylinder head, the combustion chamber, the intake manifold, the carburetor tube, and the carburetor. This is uh, a little valve inside that regulates the air flowing into the engine. Okay. This is the exhaust chamber. This uh, elbow attaches to the motor. This is the exhaust chamber. There's an exhaust, there's a valve inside here that operates uh, as, the as the need for exhaust gases to escape occurs. This valve is opened mechanically. Exhaust gases leave the elbow into the exhaust chamber and into a muffler that hangs down below the, uh, below the engine. Installing the timing mechanism for the exhaust valve. This uh, dries off the crankshaft. And also included in this, when we finish on this part of it, will be the ignition, by the ignition system, because it uses the reference of the crankshaft and this timing gear to signal when to fire the air fuel mixture. operates the, uh, the exhaust. You can see when it comes around, it hits this part of the exhaust valve, and that's what opens the exhaust valve. And there's a spring that holds the exhaust valve closed, and every time the crankshaft rotates like that, it forces the exhaust valve open. So that's, that's part of the exhaust cycle, exhaust stroke of the work cycle. wanted to get students involved in the project and of course one one component of this is the finish that is on the carriage so I talked with Clifford Flint who is the principal at Roger L Putnam vocational technical high school and asked if it was permissible for the students to in the auto body shop to become part of the production of this car. And he was more than gracious in allowing the students to use the shop during non-school hours, which is Saturday. And so 
six students from the auto body program came to the school and along with an instructor were able to prime the carriage body and all the wooden parts as well as give the finished paint the whole time taking about seven hours from the time they began hanging the parts in the spray booth until the time when they actually finished for the day. So they definitely were, were intrigued by the, the concept of the car and, and wanting to be a part of it, but they also gave their all. Barbara Thomas was referred to me by a friend to do the upholstering on the car. Barbara runs her own upholstery business. And as you can see from the quality of the work that's in the, done in the upholstery, that I made a good choice. We're going to put on the side panel, and I wanted to show you um, how it was going to go on. Because we need, um, we're not going to use the old horse hair. We're going to use the synthetic horse hair. Let this open to show you um, basically what the springs, what they look like when they're compressed. You want to catch the springs in three different places. Now, this is synthetic horse hair. We use this today, it's a little easier to work with. I'm going to put just another layer on there, and then we'll put the side, uh, the cover, the fabric on. I'm bringing this as tight as I can, right to the edge, because we're going to use a trim on the edge over here. Richard, here's the back. Basically, what we talked about doing in um, from the pictures that you gave me, it's actually a channel back. It's called rolled and pleating. We're just going to staple this on the top, and then I'm just going to run a hand stitch across here and on the bottom, too. Okay, 
Okay, we're going to pull this up and we're going to attach it in the center. But we're just going to attach the burlap. You want to see what it looks like with the apron? Yeah, actually, I'd like to see what okay. all the pieces that we have to put in here. This is where the apron, how the apron will look. And this will be rolled under, and so it'll be a finished edge there. And then the cushion. We have one made up. You can see how nicely meet the back channels. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one more and then we're ready to take it for a spin. We're going to try and get um, fuel into, this, into the engine at this point. Um, the carburetor has a fuel adjustment, it has an air adjustment, and we want to get, make sure that the fuel going into the engine is enough to fire inside the cylinder. So I'll be controlling the, um, the fuel side of it, Jim's going to be hold, controlling the spark side of it, and Ricky's going to be controlling the spinning of the engine. Um, Let me know when you want to spark it. Um, okay. Um, you ready? Ready? I'm ready. Should we try? Okay. Waiting, wa waiting for a while here. Okay. Let me get it off the compression stroke. It does have compression. Okay. Set? Yep. Still drawing in fuel, reach governor speed. When that came down, it's like, you know, once again, it's like, I don't know, it, it sounded strange, almost like there was some something firing through the exhaust. I may have just been imagining. Let's do it up one more time. Um, yeah. Um, of course, with the with the exhaust poured up on this angle, it's going to have to fill up to there before it's going to push it out, unless it pushes out its vapors. Okay. Well, I tell you what. Let's let's go the other direction. Let's really cut back on the fuel. We may be just absolutely drowning the thing out. Okay. Let's try this time. Still drawing in a pretty healthy amount of fuel. I could almost see the point um, where it was dripping. There was it drips down between strokes and then pshh, pulls in the charge. Again, we could be too lean, we could be too rich. Just think of what poor Frank had to do, probably cranking it by hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that if they were Right. Machine shop, they built it into something. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. And the next thing is a 90 degree drive, and I'll run it off the diesel or two. Well, they had drill presses. So that was better. Okay. Set? Yep. <laughs> 
and breaks the points. It's already made the break. Okay, so it's not picking it up on the one ohm scale. It's picking it up on the 10 ohm scale, though. That's fine. That's right. So that, that's... Yeah, the 100 and the 1,000 ohms work fine. The only one it doesn't is the one ohm scale. No, I still want to... I still want to find out what I'm getting for Spark. I have one more wire around here. Let's spin it over a little bit and see what we get for Spark coming out of this. Not to, no, not to spin it over. Spin it over. With the motor. Oh, you're going to go with that one? Yeah, see what we got for, for Spark. You're using me. <clears throat> well, I, can we check? E, C. Can we pull? Unless that's arcing between the electrode. E equals and IR. And, and it side. could be bridging through the but side of the. But it's still sparking. But yeah, but this spark is a spark. That's a spark, yeah. and that's exactly what we need inside and the so chamber. And so we've got to get that inside this combustion chamber, right? So it may be that we're losing. It, it could be jumping in all directions at the same time, meaning it could be going off the micata <coughs> pull off the carburetor the end plug the end plug mm -hmm. pull off the uh, combustion spark chamber mm -hmm. take the half inch bolt that we got in there that holds the micata and drill the end of that out so we don't have anything maintaining it in inward so all it is is micata around so all it is is micata around it to give us more insulation area around it more clearance the, the, end of, the, end of the, end of the, the end of the bolt has like an eighth inch or a three sixteenth hole in it, and I have an eighth inch that you got electrode going through, so it's only you know, a good 30 seconds of an inch on the side. Okay. Open that up, just drill that out and, so that it will gap more. Isn't there an Allen plug in the back side well, of it? We're, we're going to have to take that out also. Oh, okay. All right. That's, then, that's the next then, step. Then let's, let's do that, because that is not the spark that's coming out of there. Yeah. That's what we need. That's what we need, right. Back it down just a little bit. Put them right there. Now, where are we? I'm also getting better, better reading. about um, part of what's going on could very well be that the spark arm is traveling as it travels and increases the air gap the secondary voltage dies too fast we talked about threading the shaft and locking taking out the the uh, threaded rod and mm -hmm. locking mm -hmm. the spark arm at a given gap right let's try that that in other words on a, on a fixed gap you can fire it and today, I think what we want to do is we want to make sure that it will at least run, um, because that'll take care of answering the fuel questions. Mm -hmm. It'll take care of qu and questions on compression. It'll take care of stroke uh, ratios mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that. to a certain dimension Put so it, they won't, they won't be moving. Index that now, so you got yeah. about 25 or 30. Yeah. Okay. Okay, something, something happened. Do you want to check that? Yep. Check the, uh, 
don't know if you can see in there or not. No, I can't, but I can't. Okay, there's on continuity. The, that's on the pin. What do you think? Check it again. Put it inside. Let's, let's just double check the... Uh, make contact the electrode. Yep. Okay, so we have... We have continuity there. Let me come down here. We have continuity here. Okay, so now we have that circuit is good. <clears throat> now, now the we blue have wire that we had before is a moot point. Unless, I, I don't know, I think it still should be attached you to here. I, that's what I'm thinking. Because that's our ground circuit. Exactly. And we want to make sure we have continuity back to ground and the battery. Now, one way we can do that would be to put a nut on that screw uh, and put an eyelet on it. Mm -hmm. we just, we'll use that other piece, put an eyelet on it, and, and lock it up yes. in place. Okay. Now that's a spark. Now we have spark, and I think that that's a pretty healthy spark coming yes. out of that now. It's a constant spark. I don't have a meter to measure it, but I'd say that even if we open that up a little farther, we'd probably get an even hotter spark. Well, but at this point, yeah, right. Start, this is our starting point. That's right. It's our starting point. Um, Are you happy with the timing up here, Dick? Timing out the spark up top dead? It's a few be few degrees before top dead center. Again, that, that's not a critical point. Okay. Anything is that, that translates into horsepower. Right. At this point, we're just at least trying to get get it to fire up. Okay. Um, what do we got to lose? Ready. Okay. Gas on? Yeah. Back to me. Yeah, that's a good drip. Okay. Okay, ready? Yeah. is to get the combination to get it firing up again. It's only it's only an engine. It's it's only metal. It's only leather and rubber and wires and things like that. But it's the culmination of eight years. That's that I have made this commitment to thick and thin to myself that I would do this. And um, when it when it fired off the first time, um, I I must say in all honesty that. At some point, I knew it was going to, but there's some unknowns that we have to work out. But it was a it was a very um, gratifying, rewarding experience. That I took, I took papers, and I took pictures, and I took um, various conversations that I've had over the years, and sort of combined them. And I I brought together a team. I did not do this alone. I have the two people that have worked with me for uh, almost a year now in this process and um, th we three built this engine so um, we and I think we all shared that same experience that that we had that we had accomplished something we had we'd really made a mark and it worked
the transmission that was used on that car was a combination of two drums connected by a belt. And the belt um, had one technical problem with it. And the problem is that the, the belt would rub on the underside of the flywheel. And in Charles' plan, in order to change the rate of speed of the vehicle, you'd simply relocate the belt at some point in the radius of the flywheel so that if it's, for instance, if it's close to the center, the car would move at a low rate of speed because the surface speed of the flywheel is low. And if the carriage was to go at a faster rate of speed, the, the belt would be moved to the outer portion of the flywheel where the surface speed is higher. And on paper, it seemed like a good idea. But when Frank actually built that design, and for the record, on September 21st, 1893, that is the transmission that was used, it did not give the satisfaction that Frank, the mechanic and the machinist, wanted out of that car. As it turns out, in Chicago, in 1893 was the Columbia Exposition. And Frank went to the exposition, I think with the intent of doing some more research, because he came back to Springfield with a design in his head. He put that design to paper. He machined out a series of clutches and drums and gears, all of which gave Frank the performance that he was, that he expected and with which he was satisfied. So it was a provable, workable transmission. And that's the transmission that he used in 1894, January 18th of 1894. And he drove that car for four and a half miles. And he had no problems with the transmission. So it was a very good design. In fact, Following Frank through the subsequent models of cars, he uses that system again. So it was a system that worked for him, and he decided to stick with it. When we knew that the carriage was running, when we knew how to start it, when we knew how to drive it, and when we knew how to stop it, we felt it was time. We felt that it was important that the city of Springfield have an opportunity to share a piece of this car, to be able to witness how it operates. So the day that we had our public demonstration, which was July 17th, we were nervous.
<laughs> the, the public, when we first started that, gave out a round of applause that I could not believe. It was just, it was a high that I think, speaking for the three of us, that we're still all riding on. It was the, it was the pinnacle of our project coming together. That first public drive at the Quad, yeah, it was a proud moment. It was a proud moment for the team, but it was a proud moment for me, too, because it was kind of fun to stand back in the crowd. I wasn't part of the big hoopla. I mean, I helped start the car, and I was there, but I was able to walk out of that crowd, and I was able to look around at the expressions, hear the noise of the car, hear the expression, the, the applause, uh, and be part of that applause. Uh, and it, it just... It just made me feel good to see that what we had done was appreciated. To have had the experience to drive that car for the first time in a hundred years, um, it was, it's, it's, it's a cliche, but it was a dream come true. And I lived it. It was very exciting. <laughs> watching Quadrangle Television.